Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to, the, uh, welcome to uh, this uh, monthly Playful Learning expert talk. Uh, today, I am delighted to introduce Dr. Constantine Kuehler, Senior Policy Analyst at the White House. She is currently working on a national agenda on games and learning. Um, so, you know, glad you could make it, and let's get started. Great. So officially, thank you for having me. Please enjoy your lunches. This will be informal, so if I go in a direction that seems incomprehensible, put your hand in the air so I don't keep on talking in ways that don't make any sense. And Alex Gomez, thank you. Thanks for having us. This has been a really extraordinary trip. Just what I've seen so far in the last couple hours here on the Microsoft campus has been exceptional and mind-blowing, and I'm really excited. Um, so I'm just going to walk through a little bit about, let me, well, let me first say, who am I and what am I doing? So I am um, temporarily on leave from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'm an academic who studies games and learning, games and sort of the smarter side of fandom um, and gaming uh, writ large. And I am currently uh, advising on policy in the White House Office of Science and Technology. So mostly what I want to talk about here is just sort of give you an idea of the tenor of conversation around games for impact broadly at the national level and talk a little bit about some of the initiatives that we're working on, hopefully to inform the work that you're doing and then we can start having a conversation about, about what that might look like for the future. Is that okay? All right, so, um, and in some ways I may be sort of repeating things that you already know, which is nice. Usually I speak to audiences where I have to actually um, uh, put many different numbers in front of them of various sorts in order to help them understand that games are in fact a vital part of our economy, a vital part of our culture, of our art forms, etc. But in case you are not aware, you know, they are in fact considered a vital part of our economy. If you just look at the numbers of um, consumer spending, you end up around 25.1 billion. Much to other people's surprise, how this lines up versus things like the music industry is, you know, a good uh, two and a half times times something like the movie box office uh, income uh, profits for um, in America. It's also one of our fastest growing economies. Um, and global numbers, the forecast, if you saw last, what, two months ago, and Economist had a nice spread on some of the predictions around the economy of video games and its global markets. But um, uh, one of the more compelling statistics I find is thinking about it in terms of just our national GDP. So from 2005 to 2010, that GDP rose by about 16%. So to give you a good comparison point, video games are more than doubled, right? So this is, compared to other um, economic sectors, this is a high growth area. But what has that got to do with the na addressing national challenges? So my role in the White House is not simply making the economic argument that games are an important part of our economy, albeit though they are, and that alone should have people paying attention. But in fact, my work actually focuses on how might we think about games as a go-to strategy um, for thinking about some of our national grand challenges, our stretch goals, and the administration's current goals right now. So, you know, in, in this audience, I don't have to explain many of things, but if you think about the potential for games, obviously they have massive potential for engagement. That's what game designers do, is design experiences to be engaging. Um, the fact that they are thoroughly social, they're also ubiquitous across not just demographics. So we have, you know, this isn't 10 years ago where a much smaller uh, a variety of people gamed. In fact, now it's become a mainstream activity. If you look at things like the apps store on something like your iPhone, games are the major push. Um, they're also ubiquitous across the everyday routine. So if you get on the metro in DC, you know, it's hard to enter a car where at least a good fourth of them are not playing some form of game on, an, on a touch screen typically. Um, but there's other points that make this <clears throat> a particularly salient strategy. They're conceptually transformative. So some of the work that we just heard a couple hours ago upstairs about thinking as games and gamification as a way to do things like even debug systems. Um, they can be used to explore space, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, they're obviously leading technologies. Uh, my computer replacement rate, given particular computer games that I happen to like, is ridiculous. So as games move into the home, so do advanced technologies. They're also rich for data analytics and assessment, and of course, they're links to STEM careers. You know, if you're not here at Microsoft campus or in the tech industry, it is surprising to find out that games are in fact the biggest hobby space um, that we all have in common. Games have a huge influence on STEM-related careers, on technology-related careers, on advanced manufacturing, but a lot of that influence is left sort of unspoken unless you're in those industries themselves. So as far as potential go, games have a lot to offer in many ways. Um, the research on video games is equally compelling. And here's just a smattering of some of the findings. So, um, and um, I won't dig into too much of this, but you know, the, the, the empirical argument that games may do more than, um, than convey certain cultural themes that, that are, um, that are controversial, uh, this, this argument has now been put to rest. So there are growing bodies of research and academic disciplines dedicated to things like literacy in games, basic reading and writing, all the way over to digital literacy, neuroscience around visual acuity, attention, um, scientific discovering, not just fold it and thinking about high-end scientific discovery, but games, there's a growing body of evidence around um, games as entree into thinking like a scientist, into doing hypothesis testing, into doing things like theory crafting and World of Warcraft, etc. So the research is equally compelling with that. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with um, any of the federal reports that came out, but in 2009, was it 2009, the National Academies of Science put out a report called Learning Science Through Computer Games and Simulations. Um, and in the front end of that, the, the goal for this report was simply that there has been a new call for um, different strategies toward teaching science and science literacy in the classroom um, with a general idea of engaging students in, um, as it says, you know, developing understanding of both science concepts and science processes. And the conclusion of the report was that, in fact, computer simulations and games have great potential. <clears throat> in terms of the state of evidence uh, for, uh, th this is research studies around STEM in particular, um, most of the evidence, so here you've got um, the five main core categories of, of STEM learning that uh, show up across things like um, our core standards, et cetera. So here's five main sort of topical areas in STEM. And if you look at both the uh, evidence in games and ev the evidence in simulations, simulations, by the way, in science have been used in the classroom for the last, I don't know, 85, 95, uh, 25 years, something like that. Um, so you'll see that, in fact, games were marked as emerging but inconclusive. Of course, if you look over at simulations, it has a huge leg up historically on games. Uh, if you compare the two, games are not faring poorly here at all. So uh, the evidence, so National Academies of Science and other major institutions that are basically the keepers of our um, collective knowledge from academia have now sort of concluded that games are uh, a ripe strategy for thinking about engaging kids in STEM, which is a plus uh, for us. Um, but it's not just science. Um, now we've grown from... When I first started studying games, there maybe were, gosh, I guess zero at the time, but that grew to probably two or three programs at universities studying the impact of games uh, beyond studying simply violence. And now that collection has grown to probably 20 different schools of tier one academic studying games and across a whole bevy of topics, certainly not just STEM. So you have both the economic argument that games are a compelling part of our economy, and you also have a growing body of, of empirical research showing that games can have really interesting positive outcomes for kids and adults. So this is sort of the background against which the White House starts to get interested in games as a particular policy strategy. So I want to talk a little bit about the history of this strategy with Obama's White House. You know, since the campaign trail, uh, President Barack Obama has been an advocate of science literacy and STEM education more broadly. 
This has not always been the case in the White House administration. Yet for Obama's administration, he does in fact see STEM education and 21st, so-called 21st century skills as absolutely foundational uh, to the other goals that we have as a nation. So let me try and say that a different way. Unlike previous Unlike previous administrations, this administration sees understanding science and understanding technology as core to our entire, um, our entire future as a nation, which means that there is a lot of concern and energy and momentum behind topics around that. Um, back in almost a year ago at Tech Boston, Obama, talking to a group of students, actually issued a challenge and said, I want you guys to be stuck on a video game that teaches you something other than just blowing something up. So you start to see the general rhetoric and tenor of conversation around games emerge. If you paid much attention to um, you know, games that the first family plays this last holiday season, <clears throat> we had great clips of Obama buying games for his own children. Of course, Michelle Obama, the first lady, um, has long been an advocate of fitness, nutrition, uh, through her Let's Move campaign, and has issued, for example, um, the Healthier Apps choice. Now, this had a game component to it that wasn't solely focused on games. But here, you know, one thing that I found so interesting about this mobile apps challenge, which was before my tenure at the White House, um, what I found so interesting here was that the general strategy was release federal government data and then enable the private market to innovate applications that might leverage those data for consumers, which is a really interesting strategy and one you'll see repeated again and again across various agencies. Um, so, uh, if, and if you're interested in this kind of work, the HHS and Todd Parks, who is the Chief Technology Officer of um, HHS, his entire team for innovation focuses on just this strategy, which is release federal data um, and then help innovate and spur, um, and spur technology development toward leveraging those data, which is fabulous to say the least. Now my own office is John Holdren's office. This is the Office of Science and Technology Policy. Is anyone in here familiar with this office? Yeah, I wasn't either when I first started having conversation about joining it. Um, so John Holdren, <clears throat> this gentleman, John Holdren is uh, Obama's science director. In our office, we really have four core topical areas. This uh, office, it's a fairly small office in the White House of about 60 people, 60 to 75, I think. So there are four core topical areas, science, technology, uh, security, and then environment and energy. Um, it's revealing that I was originally uh, asked to take on the topic of Games for Impact and a national agenda toward Games for Impact. And originally that was straight under the director's office, so I kind of work with teams that do innovation. And within the first couple months, I became assigned to every team except, except environment and energy. I'm pretty sure I get some form of badge or achievement pops, I ding at some point, if I can conquer that one as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I use this to illustrate the fact that games, um, the administration is open to technology strategies, including interactive technologies like games, not just for something like learning and education, but in fact to think about improving our cybersecurity, issues of national security, to think about um, um, you know, how do you increase not just scientific literacy, but how do you actually spur innovation like the work of Zoran Popovic and Fold It. So thinking about scientific discovery. So games have been um, construed for me as games for impact across almost every area, health, fitness, energy consumption, et cetera. And when I joined, Tom Khalil, who is the main person I report to, asked me two simple questions. And they're not really so simple, but I'll tell you a little bit about how we're starting to frame and operationalize them. And the first one is simply what games should be built. What game, what are some really sweet spots where um, the administration has set certain goals and games may be a go-to strategy or a way in which we might think about accomplishing those goals? And the second one was, uh, in some ways, more challenging than the one that I, I um, is probably um, makes fewer headlines, but I see as the longer lasting impact, which is how do you think about creating an environment for innovating in that space? So in my assessment, games for impact 
are in some ways kind of a blue ocean market. Like there are some people moving into that space and you guys are some of them. Um, but in many ways, there's this market that's there waiting to sort of be actualized. So the question is, how do you think about spurring innovation into that market in ways that aren't happening yet? And I should also ask the question, what is in fact the role of the federal government in doing that? Right? I mean, the, the two basic rules of thumb of um, policy advising at the federal level, two of a couple probably, but um, you know, one is that federal tax dollars should go to places where on the cutting edge of innovation, and although private market does some things very, very well, if you look back at certain major technological innovations like, say, the internet, those actually had federal dollars far before they were ever monetized on the private market. So that's one role of federal tax dollars. But the second role is also um, investing in spaces where there's no, there's no large enough clear return for private companies to be able to invest in it themselves. So when, they, they, when there are spaces in which the public good is very high, but the individual profit to be made for a particular company is just isn't high enough for someone to invest in that way, that's another important role of the federal government. So keep those two things in mind. So when I say something like, how do you create an innovation ecosystem, that also means like, how do you try to think about how to leverage the federal government dollars in ways that you're either at the cutting edge of innovation or you're trying to um, spur development in an area where it may just not be profitable enough. Topics I work on. Uh, this is literally a page from my current portfolio. So there's really kind of three themes of things I'm currently working on. The first one is thinking about games for impact in specific areas. So, you know, the question of where are the sweet spots when it comes to games for impact and the administration initiatives, administration sort of goals, uh, topics like energy conservation, um, uh, neuroscience, casual games, well-being, financial literacy. You could also add to that list several other topics like civic engagement. The second big theme is infrastructure. So, um, how going back to how do you create that environment uh, for innovation. And the third one is really kind of trying to think about pushing discovery. So there's a lot of work to be done. I mentioned some of Todd Park's work with releasing federal data, but some of the big name of the game in the office in which I work are um, discussions around data liberation. So what are the assets the federal government has that it can release for its public market that are not simply just tax dollars? So reliable data sets are one of them. Um, Thinking about analytics, so learning analytics and, of course, discovery games of Zorin and other, um, other efforts in that space. So I'm going to say a little bit more about infrastructure because that's where my head is at right now and I probably relates to you guys the most. So um, on the topic of, let me go back to this. So three main things that we've been working on uh, at the top of that list. First is sort of establishing some form of community of practice of the people who are investing federal dollars in games. It turns out that um, uh, I expected when I first convened a group of people working at the federal level across agencies, so across like DOD, across um, you know uh, Department of the Interior, et cetera. When I first convened people that were actually involved in games just to sort of do a landscape analysis of who's doing what in this space, I expected to run into about 30 people, 40 people. That group has gotten very, very large. It's actually the first meeting we had was 70 attendees, 23 agencies. It's now at 147 and 33 agencies. And that's actually a bogus number already. It's already like 170 people who are actually immediately involved in games and game investments. Now keep in mind that for many of the people who are, um, in, it, who are attempting to invest in games from a federal level, they're operating with a portfolio that spans all kinds of technologies and strategies, let's say within Department of Education. So a Department of Education program officer has a portfolio of projects that are funded through their particular program and games may be one of them. Those game investments have been around for five, six, eight years. So the idea of the government being interested in games, that has already been going on long before I started my position at the White House. Um, the difference is that my role is to help coordinate that interagency conversation to help figure out, are we investing in the right things? Are we investing in innovation? Are we redundant in places? Are we, you know, are there gaps or um, redundancies in what we're doing. 
So it has actually been a surprisingly large group. Um, in terms of representativeness, you'll see the three sort of predominant theme, the three kind of predominant emphases right now in the government is military health and education. That should come as no surprise, though maybe the health one. But um, those are kind of the three biggest standing rep representatives in this particular group. Um, and one thing that we've done already is sort of form a more official cross-agency wing called, there's this committee, like sort of a committee, it sits above, uh, sits above agencies at the sort of a cross-agency level of, um, we've just put in place a first ever uh, games committee with games in the title. At some point I had to hold the charter up and just sort of put it on my desk like, I believe we've just made a committee in the federal government that has the word games in it which is not like a press release about how it's going to rot the minds of youth. I was like, score. <clears throat> Personal triumph there. I just want to get that out there. Thank you. <laughs> I know, it's great. Um, universities, so the second major effort I'll talk about is just sort of building university consortiums. So once we started looking around, that group of higher um, institutions, academics that are already engaged in thriving programs around Games for Impact has grown from just a couple to a good large swath. So part of what we've been doing is putting those universities in conversation to talk about things like, okay, how are we thinking about uh, privacy? How are we thinking about ownership? What are we doing that's open source versus closed? How do we solve problems like sharing data in certain ways so that we can build algorithms that might actually trace what people are accomplishing without having to rebuild the wheel again and again at every institution? So thinking about what are some of the pain points we have in common or assets that we could share. Um, <coughs> excuse me, I have a terrible cold right now. Um, that we could get together as a community of universities and actually start pushing the market in that way. Here's why this is so important, right? Here, this is the thing that plagues my existence and always has. Games for impact have to be great games and they also have to have demonstrable impact. It is simply not good enough to say we think that it's, we believe that our, our title is educational, right? We need to be able to build some form of argument based on data that it has impact in whatever direction we claim it does. Well, that means the marriage of two things that in, in some conversations have been sort of incommensurate. It means that you have to have really great design chops. You have to know how to build a game that's worth playing. For me, the golden standard is people should play it voluntarily and pay to play it. It should be marketable, not I have to assign it in classrooms and like bribe you with extra credit to get you to do it. Right? So it has to be a great game, and that's hard. And most of that talent sits in the industry. Some of it sits in higher ed a little bit, there's some, but for the most part, it's an industry. Versus the second, which is games that actually have impact. Games that there is an empirical argument that they have impact, and a non-biased, non-profit driven argument that they have impact. So part of the reason to build something like a university consortium is to say, are there ways that we could partner so that we can start dealing with building great games that are great games, but also researching those games in order to make that argument for the public and for ourselves that, in fact, they're having the impact we say that they have? Um, one thing I love about this is that on the abstract level, that sounds like, good luck with that, sure. And yet, I guess because I've gotten old in this field, I have yet to go to any actual meeting where academics and designers weren't in the same space, playing the same games, talking to each other with absolutely no problem about like how to think about progression through a level, right? So in practice, um, where I think in some ways there's a sort of culture clash between the two general institutions of private sector industry versus academics, the truth is that all that is hogwash when you actually just sit down and talk to each other. And I see that happen again and again and again, right? I mean, just the academic presence at GDC, I'm like, this is awesome, this is amazing. I remember when there were no academics at GDC because simply they, they believed that you didn't have to pay attention to great design. And then it turns out you do, right? So it's great to have them attending to um, the expertise that's already in industry and vice versa, right? We're seeing more and more of game designers uh, become interested in these topics and join higher, join both game design labs at universities, but also take on tenure track positions at universities and start teaching and building that next community. 
Well, so what is the role of industry here? Uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but for many of the, of the serious video game uh, titles, the publishers are not at all the commercial publishers. And while you guys may be the exception to the rule, most of what I spend my time wading through as far as serious games or games for impact <coughs> tends to actually have a publisher over here. And just ask yourself how well the Federation of American Scientists, for example, what do they know about game publishing? Yeah, exactly, right? Turns out that that's a whole other level of knowledge that is still way over in commercial and actually not in conversation yet with who right now is publishing some of those main titles. So figuring out how to get these groups in better conversation would be a good thing. Um, but here's some other ones. I can't stand the, there. So here's some other sort of leadership roles that I've talked to people in industry about. So thinking about things like sabbaticals, what I just talked about with game industry designers actually taking sabbatical and teaching uh, both undergrads and grads in uh, higher institutions, or vice versa, thinking about professors and researchers, whether it's, I keep focusing on, on academics, but actually some of those researchers reside not just in industry, but also in um, you know, think tanks and philanthropy, though, to a much smaller extent. But thinking about how do we start to cross-pollinate in ways that it would be really, like how do we create a world in which you, it's viable for you to come to my institution and intern for a year and teach some courses where people might learn from you, and vice versa, where someone in your lab, you might actually have a PhD researcher on you know, data modeling of a particular ilk who works with you on thinking about how can you build that empirical argument that impact is actually taking place. Um, so I've already talked about university relationships. Um, another issue, this second couple ones, is thinking about how can we start talking about assets that are shareable versus assets that we want to hang on to and monetize ourselves, right? So what are the assets, whether it be data sets or even in some cases, you know, I, I've seen some really interesting examples of um, game engines that have been built on federal dollars and thinking about how can we make those shareable because they are in fact now a federal investment, so why can't we make those shareable in some capacity? Or I guess, to be more precise, like where can you do that and where do you need to actually keep it private? Um, and then the final ones are a little bit more general, but thinking about, you know, how do we actually enable rigorous research on impact? Um, you know, there's precedence in other fields to do partnerships where you create, you know, you create some form of like, I'm thinking right now of like pharmaceuticals, where in fact the research arm is separate as a way, yet there's deep compatibility between both research and development. Um, so thinking about how can you actually enable some of that research to happen. Um, and I'm just going to end there and hopefully you have some questions as well. But I will say this, part of the reason why I'm here is because um, this is certainly an administration that uh, believes in all hands on deck. That right now, um, you know, some of the grand challenges that this administration has every single intention of addressing requires people, requires input not just from people who know the federal government, but including folks like me that are not necessarily insiders to federal government, but they actually want input on how to do games for impact. And that also includes people in industry who understand some of these problems much better than um, government or academic may, right? I mean, the old adage that no matter how great your company, most smart people do not work for you. Um, that adage is true as well of administration of the federal government as a whole. So the idea of having broad conversations and going on big listening tours is just simply part of how we get our work done. So I'm going to open it up to questions there. I think we have another 20 minutes with our room. And I would love if you guys were open to just having a conversation, whether about some of the interesting things that you're working on here and how we might think about um, what are some intersections between what's going on the federal level and that work, or questions you have about what am I talking about with uh, topic X and building a guild thing at a federal level. Sound all right? All right. One of the things we struggle with, Larry, because our charter is a group, and I don't know how much you, Alex, Alex has talked to you about it, but it, it's, it's trying to go to the blue ocean of saying, this is something that's incredibly fun and also incredibly good for the game. Right. Um, and we struggle in defining exactly, so what is a good for you game? And, and you had serious games and then the commercial ones. 
Do you have a definition of what's a serious game? <sighs> and we have, for example, scribble notes. I don't know if you're familiar with scribble notes. Yeah. And that, for us, is, was sort of our guiding light, which is very high on both. <laughs> right. That does set a very high bar on both, and that's exactly where it should be, right? I can't tell you how tired I am of seeing B plus or B minus or frankly C minus games that then, you know, uh, I guess I'm talking now about like certain federal grants where it's like, look, we took a bunch of money. We made a fairly mediocre to bad game. And then we researched the crap out of it to show that it's a kind of fairly mediocre to bad game, right? So the bar needs to be way higher than where it is. Um, so thank you for helping set that bar. I mean, as far as defining, like, what is a serious game, that's a really tough question that I struggle with. You know, so <clears throat> to take my White House hat off for a minute and just play the academic person, my own bias to date has always been studying commercial games, not because... Um, I don't believe in games for impact, but simply because I'm, as a researcher, very interested in what everyday person plays, not what niche community plays. So my interest has always been in kind of following the titles that garner the largest crowds, and those are consistently commercial games, right? So when asked the question of what's a game for impact, that's a really tough question because the the games that I would naturally pull are often commercial titles that were intended to delight, to entertain, to scare the crap out of you, to do whatever, to help you, so to allow you to socialize, to allow you to frag one another. Um, and the, the impact part was um, uh, a byproduct, but not an intended one, right? So what is a game for impact? I mean, I think, I think the hard part about that is that I've seen games that had no simple casual games that had no intention to have impact, but put in the right context and the right curriculum or the right activity uh, can do amazing things. I've also seen games that had every intention to, to teach something or to change a practice that had no effect whatsoever. So um, I don't know that there's like a hard definition. I will say this. I will say that, number one, I do not see games for impact as a genre. One thing I think is really stymieing both development and research is that people tend to treat it right now because the communities are too segregated as some sort of weird genre. And I'm like, games for impact are not a genre, right? They're simply a way to talk about games that are hopefully good games. Um, but beyond that, I, I'm not sure, I'm not sure that, that there's a clear way to sort of define it. And the reason I brought this slide back up was that I will tell you this. So in this report, I was part of the committee that put this together, and I mean, that was like, I think we did most of our work in like 2008, and it took two years for us to get this report out. So by the time it came out, you're talking about games that some of them no longer even exist, which was interesting, uh, an interesting lesson, I should say, and uh, how hard some of this work is. But in, in this particular document, I worked with a, a gentleman named Carl Wyman who has a Nobel Prize in Physics, and he and I were matched to actually do this state of the evidence part. So wading through the evidence about games and the part about simulations. And Carl Wyman's expertise is the simulation side and my expertise is the game side. It was a very interesting conversation. We did a lot of thumb wrestling to see who was going to win, various arguments. Um, but the hardest part about this, uh, about growing this, trying to even write a synthetic document about the state of evidence was really difficult because many of the studies, you couldn't even figure out like what the goal was, right? So. The, I guess to make to to end this long answer, it's that I will say that like um, in the game titles that you're working on, if you can even specify like what are the actual goals for impact that you want, and I don't mean that in like a overly narrow way. I don't mean that in a way like our goal is to increase students' performance on eighth grade science by one standard deviation. Like that to me is pretty narrow, and that's fine if you want to do it. But I mean even in a broader sense, like. I would just like to have someone be interested in science longer than they might have otherwise. Or I would just like to uh, engage someone in contributing to a group uh, where, your con you, where your contribution makes a difference and just to have that experience. Or whatever the impact goal is, if it's specified, then you can get some traction on the research, right? The hardest part is when there is no goal specified. There's just a design and some claims about it. Um, so I don't know if that helps at all. It certainly doesn't help you define it, but at least if we can get specific about goals, I mean, games match to particular goals, I think we might get some traction.
Yeah. So how is the White House spending their dollars for trying to increase the, uh, the impact of games? Is it, is it more on the, the research side, or is it like giving grants to uh, independent developers? Or how is right. that sort of being structured? So I assume you mean the agencies versus the White House, because by the way, my own salary is coming out of my own pocket of grants back at my home institution. So, yeah. yeah. So I mean, the White House, and the awesome part about this interesting job is that we control no budget whatsoever. We have no budget, right? <laughs> Things we do well, we do meetings really well. We do policy advising really well. I can convene the crap out of a topic, like let's convene, let's do it, you know. But it's but you can get a lot of leverage out of those things. But that said, so are you thinking about like how the agencies are like? Yes, or, or even like what their their goal would be to you know try to steer funds places. Right. Um, so. Hmm. Okay. So what would be the White House goals? So the agency goals are truly very broad. So what, for example, um, is going on in Department of Defense um, is even wildly different than what's going on in DARPA. So DARPA right now is much more interested in sort of like crowdsourcing and exploration and sort of cybersecurity and much more cutting edge topics. Department of Defense, you see a whole lot more of sort of military training simulations, which are games, but in a very narrowed sense. Um, so my, so my role is to advise across all of these areas, which is fairly broad. Um, and I can tell you what my priorities are. And here they are. There. So my priorities right now, my, um, the last couple months have focused primarily on infrastructure. So thinking about how to shore up what we're doing with federal dollars and how to get much better communication between industry academics and federal money. Like how do you make that triangle work? Including things like, can I create an event that's piggybacked on a designer event where I can literally take the program officers that control those dollars and put them in the same room with people who do game design and have a conversation so that they can get a better sense of even simple things like game design requires iteration. Your grants don't allow iteration. If you do not allow iteration, you are stymieing the product, right? So just conversations like that. So right now my head is much more in this infrastructure space. But I would say on the first question that Khalil gave me of what should we be building? I would say probably these are the five top themes in play. So thinking about fitness, energy conservation, really thinking about how do we marry stuff like the emergence of smart grids and better data, like consumers can now get much better data about their own energy consumption and thinking about how could you use games as a way to, as a way to engage people in their own energy, energy consumption. So that's another very hot spot. Um, uh, financial literacy is one that has actually been developing long before uh, I came into the picture. But on that topic, um, the sheer fact that um, so many games, basic, financial literacy concepts are already embedded in so many games um, is an interesting sweet spot to think about. Well, you know, for example, I'm going to go back to World of Warcraft because that was some of the earlier work I did. Wow, so it turns out that like there's a whole thriving community, conversation, theor theory crafting, mods, and part of the game, if you do not understand how to, so for example, you know, sell high and buy low, you simply don't go forward, right? So thinking about like what's the marriage there, like how can you think about that as a game mechanic? Does that help? Yeah, sure. So, okay. you, so you guys are more just like an advisement body is what you're saying then. Um, mm -hmm. Trying to give people uh, this sort of, these sort of resources to help them build these sorts of games. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, um, and because we advise to the White House level, we advise, we do not get into the business of procurement on any level. Instead, we're much more abstracted than that. So we advise on what are good investments. So for example, a typical thing would be to issue an advisory kind of paper that might say, here are seven areas I believe are high return on investment. We should be innovating. And that document would then influence down the pipeline. Well, that was abstracted, but hopefully helpful. <laughs> Yeah. So what, one of the goals that we have, and, and certainly one of the challenges, is trying to help educators become successful. And there's certainly no shortage of challenges there uh, that we try to do, especially with Kodu and hopefully yeah. with future products, um, is giving them, whether it's 
information or education or training or you know tools, most of the code is free. So what do you see on a federal level as far as initiatives there that are helping that? That are helping teachers? Yeah, that are helping really kind of make teachers be more successful in kind of doing what we're, we're trying to see here. <laughs> what do you think about that? It's on a federal level. I mean, there is, I mean, that's, you know, it's interesting. We were having this conversation earlier today or yesterday about, you know, education is a particularly sticky topic because so much of education happens at a state level versus a federal level. Um, and now we have like a common core, which is just even the beginning of a common language. Um, but in the Department of Education, I would say that they are one of the slow, I mean, I'm being overly honest here, but they are one of the slower branches to warm to games in certain ways. And yet, for example, there's discussion of um, SBIRs that might spur small business. So an SBIR, I forget the exact acronym of it, but essentially it's to, smur to spur small business partnerships with federal dollars to create things like Games for Innovation. Now, the discussion about teachers is always sort of a precarious one and a, um, a hot political one as well. Um, I would say that, um, you know, probably the best work I'm seeing done right now is Jim Holdren's office through the um, uh, Investment for Innovation, I believe it's called, and Karen Cater, who is our educational technology person in Department of Ed. Both of those are really big innovators. But, you know, the interesting sort of rule of thumb that um, I've run into that I think is kind of a problem and why I have nothing tangible to really report to you is that I think that in conversations about learning technologies, for anyone geeky enough like me to pay much attention to it, there is suddenly a lot of conversation about technology and learning. Right? Three years ago, this was not the case. Suddenly, it's very hot, and there's a lot of venture capital going in, a lot of new companies, a lot of large uh, uh, publishers moving into this space and buying small companies, so it's just a lot in play. Um, and part of the big glory of this is really thinking about big data sets. There is almost a, an almost utopian view toward technologies for learning and then just if we just get the assessment metrics right if we just get the research right then almost as though the technology will be the solution to learning so teachers get left out of that conversation a lot um, it's not very popular and it doesn't make the headlines to say that in fact like a technology tool forget it just being a game any kind of technology tool is really only as good as the conversation around it right the same is true of every medium I know but that doesn't really it's not a very popular thing to say. It certainly doesn't get the headlines, and it doesn't get the kind of, you know, what, what's the venture capitalist supposed to invest in? You're like, conversations with good teachers? It's hard to do, right? So um, I would say that, uh, you know, trying to get, like, teachers, and even forget about teachers in classrooms. I mean, I, I'm also as equally, if not more, interested in things like parent conversations or peer-to-peer -peer conversations, like getting the fandom spaces back in. The equation of where learning is taking place is a tough nut to crack. Um, of course, keep in mind that I am the only social scientist in my office. The only one, right? So it may just be that in my corner of the woods, I hear a particular conversation, and it may look differently and much more optimistic when you go to Department of Ed. I don't know. I just gave you a depressing answer, though, and I'm sorry. <laughs> no. Which actually is a call to arms. It means keep doing your work. Right. right. <laughs> Can I ask, ask you a question? Are there any policy um, roadblocks that you run into in yeah, interesting. moving forward with educating teachers from one code or uh, with getting technology in schools, uh, particularly at the public level? You know, now that like, well, the school doesn't have there's not enough computers. Yeah, well, I think, you know, I know Scott can probably speak to this too, but it's, it's, it's just a big job, right? There's a lot of teachers out there. I mean, every day we're hearing teachers that are like, hey, we, we need some help. We'd like to talk to you about the school. How can we learn to do it? And, you know, we're trying to do, do our best to really reach out to these folks and, and help them. And they're very, they really want to do it, right? They're excited. These teachers really, like, get fired up about this stuff. Wow. So that kind of gets us excited. That's right. But it's just such a big job that we're... It just seems like, and I know the UK is doing a lot of talk, and Alex is talking about that. They're doing a lot of stuff over there to try to kind of get that across the board. It just seems like we're we're doing the bottom up. It seems like there should be some sort of top down push to kind of help as well. Yeah, and just to cap what Mike has said there too, training the teachers has been key to us. As soon as the, the teachers have this barrier to the technology, once they get into it and see it and how easy it is, 
we just absorb it, and it's fantastic. In terms of the technology, we run into a couple of things, like the graphic card issue. Uh, schools are tech typically running older systems. Uh, the Internet Explorer, I mean, obviously they don't have access to the Internet like we would here, right. so sharing levels and creating that community is sometimes tough. But uh, we find workarounds for it, and they're passionate about it, enough about it. They actually do find those workarounds. I would be very interested if, if I would love to hear, even I'll, um, here, I'm going to put up my email right now. I would love to hear your thoughts about, uh, there you go, hello, how to get it up. Um, I would love to hear your thoughts about ways to more, to, to better enable that space. Um, it strikes me that one, uh, all right, let's see if I can actually get this big. And please write this down and keep me in mind for our future stuff. But um, it seems to me that, oh, that would be terrible. <laughs> that would be wretched for all you font lovers out there. I just ruined your mind, didn't I? Um, did I get that right? I think I got that right. Um, I would love to hear your thoughts on this and continue that conversation because there isn't enough movement in that space. It occurs to me that one one potential lever might be to also... Uh, do a better job, uh, you know, in the sort of technology literacy skills that uh, incoming teachers have. There, you know, I've watched a sea change. I sit in a school of, of ed for teachers, right? And so I have gone from, I remember in 1998, literally the attitude of incoming teachers was like, not all schools have great technology, so it should be thrown out. If everyone can't have it, then no one should have it. And then the field shifted into debates about, Computing, computers, are they good for you or not? Discuss. And you're like, that's like asking me if the color blue is good for me. It's just so weird. And all of that conversation has died now, except that, so I think we see like a, a new incoming generation that's just accustomed to games, accustomed to technology. But, you know, I'm not sure that we're seeing uh, an equal level of innovation and moving forward when it comes to sort of technology in schools and programs that are actually training teachers and then supporting teachers and part of like their career ladders. So I wonder what that space looks like and if that not, might not be another place to actually reach out for a much, I know it doesn't solve the immediate problem, but like as a much longer term conversation about what does that teacher ed look like around things like interactive technologies. Well, in, my mind, in my mind, there's also a, a, a component that I think, and this actually I think is, something that at a policy level can be influenced and that is what incentivizes a teacher to pick up a technology uh, you know in the current yes. structure in the current structure of schools in, in you know, I, I would argue probably 43 out of all the states there's absolutely no incentive to get a teacher to say hey I'm gonna pick up or I'm gonna learn this new thing and that's gonna give me some sort of you know benefit in my career Right. Instead, it is, you know, if you're not teaching to that test, and, and it's interesting to me right now that you're seeing, you know, the moment that, that the administration made it optional to be part of you No know, Child Left Behind, well, states are dropping it like flies. This is, that, that's clear, you know, plain and clear why that is happening. Mm -hmm. uh, but in my mind, I, I think there's an important piece of work to be done influencing the conversations and, and the, the thinking that states are doing about around those teacher incentives. And I know that that's been you know, a central part of rethinking, you know, how do you, you know, what, Obama has talked about it, you know, on numerous occasions. How do you yeah. create those incentives? You know, I would even, and I, I know we're out of time here, but I would even raise the bar a little bit higher and much more long term to say that, you know, one of my great hopes for games is that there are understandings that you can communicate in games. There are impacts that you can have that are very difficult to get elsewhere. And like beyond all the conversation about standards and common core and content and focus on content, standardized tasks and all this stuff, one of the things that I find really compelling about games for learning is that you can get to a lot of, of really deep and important sort of content and practices that are far beyond what's articulated in standards, right? So on the one hand, the standards have been incredible, like things like Common Core have been very, very helpful in helping us have a conversation about what those goals might be. Like even putting people on the same page, it's been very helpful. But on the other part, on, on the other hand, sometimes I think, you know, some of the things that are the biggest bangs for your buck in terms of impact for games don't show up in content standards at all, right? 
I mean, uh, including simply knowing what it's like to really deeply understand a system and to be able to push on it and understand where it's going to push back. Right? You're not going to see a content standard dedicated to that specifically or to understand what it's like to like, uh, contribute to a community and have it matter in a way that once you have that happen, once you experience that, it's very hard to, to not get engaged, to, to be too, it's, it's, it's very, it becomes very difficult to be cynical about civic engagement once you actually find that something you do had real impact in the world. You know? Something you said, I mean, that's an argument I've been making since I was writing my dissertation. Right? It's, we, we, this is an area that should be basic research. It's, yes. you know, it's basic research mm -hmm. to understand how are we thinking with games. Right. We don't even know it. We don't right. understand it. And you know, we're making claims about games having impact or being good for learning or this or that and those based on different media. Mm -hmm. So yes. I, just like I couldn't mm -hmm. say, hey, I'm going to evaluate if you, you know, are able to critique you know, one flew over the cuckoo's nest by asking you to read an essay about one flew over the cuckoo's nest. Right. You know, yes. shouldn't be trying to do the same thing. Right. You know, it, it, Which is to say, we ought to set the new future standards, right, for what understanding should look like. And so, there you go. There's a call to arms. Um, I don't know what people's schedules are, but I would, uh, again, I would welcome more conversation if people have time for it, or simply email me ideas. You know, I've got uh, probably another 12 months um, to work on this project, and I'm very interested in ideas about what people would task me to do, um, and pain points that you have in your own industry, or things, observations that you've had. Um, again, as I said, this is an all hands on deck kind of move. I will tell you this. Um, the idea that the White House has someone on video games in the first place is already a huge step in the right direction. So if you think about, you know, presidents who understand media, I think that Obama certainly demonstrates an understanding of sort of new technology that heretofore we didn't really see. And I think that alone is a certain win. But I will stand up and celebrate once we actually make some traction and more stuff happens like what you're actually building now. So I guess thank you for doing the work that you're doing, but um, I hope you don't hesitate in telling me how to do my job better. And thank you.